Thank, thank you, Dr. Waldrip. And trust me, and everyone knows the man in our church that the, the, feel, the feeling is, is absolutely mutual. Thank you, Matthew, for actually your introduction and also Dr. Waldrip, because I will review with you what I have been speaking to my congregation on. And this past week, I have endeavored to do what I've never done before, and that is on this holy week, this Passion Week, I have shared with my congregation a reminder of what Jesus did and said every day of that Passion Week. Now, this is a unique week, of course, the last week of Jesus' ministry on earth, but it's unique also in this. There is no other week in the Gospels that is described day by day, blow by blow, of what Jesus said and did. And this is reminded to us in so many ways. One way is that it's over-representation in the Gospel record. Depending on what Gospel, anywhere from 30 to up to 50% of the Gospel record records just this last week of the Passion Week. And so it's very important what Jesus said and did this last week. He was very selective. The Holy Spirit was very selective in what he told us. The Apostle John, I'm paraphrasing, of course, and that is, if everything that Jesus did and said was recorded, it would take all the books in the world to record his ministry, the pregnancy of it. And of course, we don't have all the books in the world. We just have one moderately sized book, the Bible. And so we need to hone in on this last week, this Passion Week. And so let me review with you in a very cursorily, because so much depth here in what Jesus said the last week, of what he did, what he said, and how I approached it this week. I gave the overview of what he did, and then I preached a message based upon a text of what he did or said in that week. So this last Sunday, of course, was Palm Sunday, the so-called triumphant entry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you know the, the picture, the ecstatic crowds laid down palm branches, their outer garments, and they all extolled Jesus. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. And that was a quote from Psalm 118, and that psalm is very pivotal, a messianic psalm regarding Passover. And of course, their thought of the Messiah was not who he was at that time. He was not, uh, meant, me, he was not Mashiach ben David. He was Messiah ben Joseph as a suffering servant. In their mind, they had just witnessed Jesus' miraculous raising of Lazarus from the dead just the day before. And so they thought, here comes the Messiah, and if he can do a miracle of raising up Lazarus, certainly he can do the miracle of toppling over Rome, lead a revolution, so that we would no longer be under the thumb of Roman rule. That was their expectation, most of them. And so when they, in their jubilee, in their jubilation, that's what they were celebrating. But of course, their celebration was misplaced and short-lived. And Jesus, after later that day, after the triumphant entry, he wept over the city. He wept because he knew that God the Father would use Rome itself, the Emperor Titus, and just a generation, to judge them, their city, their cherished of Jerusalem, and their cherished temple, and all would be gone. Later that day, Jesus predicts his, his, his death on the cross, and then he enters the temple that night before he goes back to home in Bethany. He enters the temple that night to scope out what is happening at that temple. Please remember that, because the next day he does something. He finishes undone business there. I preached that Sunday morning on false and true belief, and it was based upon Jesus' words 
While you have the light, believe in the light. Excuse me. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become a child of light. And my text was taken from Isaiah 53, 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Because they would not receive the light of Christ, and Jesus told them why. On Monday, Jesus slept in Bethany, and that was his pattern throughout the Passion Week, except for, and I'll tell you, Wednesday night, because Passover had to be celebrated within the confines of the city. So he did not go home Wednesday night because Thursday was the day of preparation for the Passover that night. But on the other nights, Jesus slept in Bethany as a guest of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And so Monday morning, he arose from Bethany on the way to Jerusalem, and he sees a fig tree. And the fig tree is one of the many symbols of the nation of Israel. And Jesus curses the fig tree. But he was not the first one to curse the nation of Israel. He already predicted the day before when he wept over the city what God the Father would do. But he reminds his disciple that God will curse the fig tree because they were unfruitful. Now, they are the chosen people of God, but... Just know that they were chosen, not particularly for salvation. It'll come later, of course, in Romans chapter 9. They were chosen to be his people, to be a light to the Gentiles, to establish monotheism, to give us the scriptures, and of course, to give us the Messiah. They gave us the Messiah, they gave us the scriptures, but they were not a light. They were unfruitful in that regard, and so God judged them. And that God had already judged them, of course, in the captivities in Assyria and Babylon. And then I mentioned in the future generation by the Roman army. And that's what the prediction was when he cursed the fig tree. That's what Jesus did on the way in to Jerusalem. When he went to Jerusalem, he went straight, took a beeline to the temple. And when he went to the temple, he scoped out before the money changers in the temple. And he proceeded to make a cord to make a whip out of cord, and he drove the money changers out, overturned their tables. And of course, quoting from the Old Testament said, you have made my house a den of thieves, a den of robbers, but my house, my father's house, shall be a house of prayer. He had holy indignation. And we need to have holy indignation with wisdom and selectivity the way that Jesus did. You're not going to disgrace my father and his house. You're not going to do this carnality and wickedness on my father's house. And he drove them out. And the religious rulers, the chief priests, the Sadducees, of course, they did not forget what Jesus did. Because this was their Black Friday. This was their Christmas season when they could make merchandise of all the Jewish pilgrims that came from all the ancient Near East. This was Passover, and from the captivities, the Assyrian, Babylonian captivities, when they were done, the diaspora occurred, and Jews were all over the ancient Near East. But they came together, converged on Passover. Jews from all over the ancient Near East. It was a busy time. And so these Jews who made merchandise of the Lord's house, This was their prime day to make money. And Jesus is cutting off their income stream, and they are livid. They will not forget what Jesus did. And so much of the the day, so Jesus cleansed the temple, and that is Monday. On Tuesday, as Jesus walks into Jerusalem, Peter knows, hey, Lord, that that fig tree that you cursed is all withered up. And Jesus uses that opportunity to tell them about faith and prayer. The passage where Jesus says that you have faith as a mustard seed, say there to yonder mountain, etc. He used that to teach about faith and prayer, the intimation being that those who represent the fig tree have no faith, they're lost. Don't be like them, have faith in God. And then when he arrived to the temple, because that's his pattern, 
sleeping in Bethany, going straight to the temple in the morning. And as you know this, the Apostle Paul did the same thing when he went to a city, straight to the temple, modeling after the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus arrives at the temple Tuesday morning, the Pharisees were waiting for him. They wanted to stop this man, they thought, that was ruining their setup, their, 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 their scheme of, of money making. And so they asked him, by what authority are you doing this? They went to unnerve him. Of course, you know what Jesus' response was. He did not answer them. He gave them a question. I'll tell you. If you answer this, I'll answer you. But what authority did John the Baptist baptize? Of course, they were thinking in their mind, and they became flummoxed because whatever they answered, they would be in trouble. And that was symbolic, representative of that day in the temple that Jesus spent. He gave parable after parable, condemning them, the Pharisees. The parable of the vineyard, the parable of the two men, the parable of the, the wedding feast, etc., condemning them that they were excluded. People coming from all over the world will enter the kingdom of God, prostitutes, harlots, tax collectors before you. They wanted to say something, but they couldn't. They couldn't. The Sadducees thought they had him, contrived a scheme of seven men that would marry seven wives in the end. Who would have her? And then Jesus, of course, told them, you do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. See, that kind of reminds us, men, we need to know the scriptures. We need to be able to answer people, and we need to know when. We don't enter conversation with people that are triflers, but somebody who is making a public show of things before others who are lost, perhaps, or even Christians, we need to be able to defend the faith. I don't believe in, in, in arguing with people as a way to win them, but if somebody comes in a contrite, humble fashion, you're counseling them, absolutely. You've got to show them the scriptures so they can trust the word of God. But we need wisdom in that. We need to know the scriptures and know when to answer people. So that was his Tuesday at the temple. And when he leaves the temple, he turns around and shows his disciples. You see that temple that you are so enamored with? There shall be not one stone left upon another. And he uses that opportunity after the, the disciples ask him, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? He launches into, of course, the Olivet Discourse, recorded in Matthew 24 and 25, where he explains, and it can only be very brief, perilous times shall come, prepare for it, but I shall come to be the Prince of Peace as I come as king of kings and lord of lords, and he lays their fears. Wednesday was a quiet day for Jerusalem. Of course, he goes to the temple, and that's all that's recorded of what Jesus did. And then it says that the Sanhedrin meant at Caiaphas, the high priest's house, in his palace, scheming, plotting, trying to hatch a plot to kill Jesus. And then that was my message Sunday night, and then I preached on a text, a messianic psalm that Jesus gave, the same messianic psalm, Psalm 118, key in Passover, where Jesus quoted Psalm 118, 22 and 23. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls in that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. This was a psalm that the Jewish pilgrims sang it every Passover, yet they never truly understood it, of course. And then on Wednesday prayer meeting, I spoke about what Jesus did on Thursday, very busy day. Begins with his instructions to his disciples on how to find the place where we will celebrate the Passover and where to find the man who is carrying a jug, and he will show you the upper room well furnished. 
And when he was there, he institutes the Lord's Supper. He washes his disciples' feet to illustrate servanthood. And one of the very poignant aspects of that, which is so touching, is when Peter says, Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. And then Jesus says, I'm paraphrasing, well, if I don't wash your feet, your feet then you're, you have no part in me. And then Jesus says, not my feet only, Lord, but my hands and my head. And that should be our response. Jesus, I want all of you. I want to be like you. I want not only positional union with you, but I want to live for you and become like you. And in fact, that is the cry that God has placed in all of our hearts. To, from the beginning, we have union with Christ. God has sent the spirit of his son in our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And he has, he, God the Father has sealed us in this tract of glory. So that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, and others Christians, true Christians, because when we see him face to face, we'll become like him, we'll have a glorified body. And that's our trek, brothers, is that we'll become like Jesus. So really nothing else. Don't get overburdened by that. It's all good. Not like the people say it's all good. No, it really is all good. No matter what trial, tribulation you're in, suffering, it's, it's to mold you and make you like Jesus. God knows what he's doing. He's an architect. We just need to trust him to do that. We need to take the long view, the perspective. And so, in the upper room, he institutes the Lord's Supper. He washes their feet. And then he gives his farewell discourse. So charming. You know, one of the benefits that, that I've had that I want to give my people was all these wonderful Bible verses that we memorize. It is now contextualized in the course of Passion Week. And let me draw just a couple that really spoke to me. And one of them is when he was in his farewell discourse, Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm going to a place where for now you cannot follow me. He's giving his farewell discourse. And of course, all the disciples' hearts sank. He's leaving me. They're despondent, they're in despair. And how does Jesus answer them? He answers them in the way that I've given at many funerals. We memorize. We know this. But in the setting and the context of their despair that Jesus is leaving me, it takes on greater poignancy. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you will be also. Yes, I'm leaving. You can't come with me now, but you will come with me. But first, I'm preparing a place for you. Contextually, it just kind of blew me away. I knew it, but I didn't know it. And then Thomas, just a couple of verses later, is thinking, okay, we're going to go with Jesus but what is the itinerary? How do I go with you, Jesus? And then Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now they know Jesus is going to leave them for a short while, but he's going to bring them to himself. He himself is going to chaperone and shepherd me to my Father. And what, what a reassurance that is, that I wouldn't have gotten if I did not review this with my, for myself, my own heart, and for my people. And then, of course, while still in the upper room, Jesus gives his high priestly prayer. So pregnant and full, I can't do service, but I'll give you an outline. He prays for himself. He prays for his disciples. And then he prays for us. Because we are those who shall believe in him, in Jesus, from their words. And everyone down through Christian history, Jesus is praying for has prayed for, is praying for. As you know, he ever liveth to make us intercession for us, and we could not endure unto the end if Jesus was not praying for us. And then they sing a hymn, most likely, Psalm 118. As Peter, as, excuse me, as Jesus predicts Peter's denial, and then they enter the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prays his agonizing prayer that he will do the will of his Father, without the help of his sleeping disciples, of course. And then I preach on 
This is Thursday night. Excuse me. I preached on Thursday night the lesson of the true vine and the branches at prayer meeting. I preached on Thursday at the Wednesday prayer meeting on Jesus, the true vine, and we the branches. So full. I don't have time to give that service, but we need to abide in Christ. And abiding in Christ is not just remaining in Christ in a static sense. That's positional union that we have that cannot be taken away from, from us if you truly trust Christ. But the abiding is a present tense, an active remaining, active fellowship. And if we have active, thriving union, then we shall produce much fruit because we are connected to Jesus. And his grace, his love, his mercy flow through us. We are a conduit. We are an empty vessel, empty of ourselves, dying to our flesh, mortifying our flesh, so we make room for the Holy Spirit of God to fill us, to fill us with the Spirit of Christ himself so we can produce much fruit. We, we don't produce anything from ourselves. We are, we're, we're just sourced from Adam. But if we're in Christ, we have another source. That's sourced from Jesus Christ. We need to tap into that source by killing our Adamic nature. Now, of course, we can't even kill our Adamic nature by ourselves. We need the Spirit of God, but we need the willingness. Brothers, we need to be willing. We believe in a sovereign God who does everything, but in a way that I cannot explain to you. There's a willingness that God does. God works and wills to do his good pleasure in us. How do we yield and not our glory? I don't know. But I know one thing. Someone who yields because he knows that he can't do it himself, that's not much of something to brag upon. If there's some big dude that comes in and says he's going to kill me, I'm going to yield to him. Can, can I get credit? Said, man, I yield to that dude. No. And so we, we stand in the presence of God. This is what I think it means. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, a paradox. And in due time, God will lift you up. The Lord will lift you up. What does it mean? God's hand is mighty. Why do we need to humble ourselves? Yet we do. And then God will lift us up. So it's the scriptures are full of paradox, but the child of God understands that. We do not resort to our cerebral understanding alone because our heart, our spirits trumps that. And in that gap we don't understand, that's where the trust of God lies. We don't understand. That's faith. The faith is the substance of things not seen, and may I add, not understood. Last night was Good Friday, another full day for Jesus. I had... Brother Fari Hernandez, read the scriptures, beginning at Judas', Judas betrayal in the garden, which circumstantially probably began after midnight Friday in the twilight of the morning, Friday. After that, Jesus was stood before Annas, the former high priest and the father-in-law of Caiaphas, for an informal hearing out of respect to Annas. Peter denies Christ after, he denies him three times after the, the rooster crows twice. The Sanhedrin condemns Jesus at sunrise. Judas changes his mind, throws back the 30 pieces of silver. And the religious rulers, they admit that he is innocent but they're not interested in innocency, in justice. They're interested in holding and maintaining their status of pride and position before men. Then Pilate sends Jesus to Herod, and Herod sends him back to Pilate. Then we showed last night the passion of Christ, beginning with Barabbas, being exchanged for Christ, and ending with Christ's death on the cross. Then I preach a sermon, Jesus, our holy substitute using as the text the gross and the grossest injustice of all, that Barabbas was released and Jesus was judged. And now we come to Saturday, and men, you don't need to stand at this reading, and I'll tell, you'll know why, but remain seated as we turn the Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, and beginning with verse 62.
Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 62, and I'll read through verse 66. Matthew 27, 62. Now the next day that followed the day of preparation, of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that this sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch. Go your way and make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. You can look up, please. But just keep your Bibles open there. That's all that was recorded on Saturday. Nothing of what Jesus said or, or did because he lay in the grave. Nothing about the disciples was said. And so if I'm going to stick to my plan of teaching and preaching on what Jesus said and do, did, I'd, I'd have to do something else. There's not even the disciples being mentioned here. Just these Pharisees scheming a plot because they, they were still afraid of Jesus. Or ra rather, they were actually afraid of his disciples. Afraid of his disciples coming to steal his body when they all forsook him and fled. When the shepherd was smited, they all forsook him and fled, fulfilling prophecy. But these desperate religious rulers, they overestimated the disciples. They thought they would come and steal the body of Jesus move the stone, and so they wanted to make sure they put, they allowed some guards to be there, a sentry or, or others, and probably the palace guards were there as well because it was them, the religious rulers, that wanted to make sure that Jesus, that his disciples wouldn't steal the body. So that was Saturday. What do I preach on? What text do I use? Do I have to pick another subject? And so, I want you to think now with me about the scenario before us. We have defeated disciples. We have them scared. We don't even know where they were. The Bible didn't tell us. We do know that when Jesus came to them on Sunday later that day, they were behind locked doors, scared. And so, it's not a stretch of the imagination to believe that they're also there, probably the upper room, there behind closed doors on Saturday, shivering, scared. What's going to happen to them? What was wrong with these disciples? Were they cowardly? Absolutely. One, make, one can make a strong case. I'm sure you know that his disciples were probably unconverted. You can make a strong case for that, but even if they were, like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus probably were, they were not likely to be acting very bold anyway. In fact, nobody was acting bold in those days. Was part of it mourning? Yes, part of it's mourning, but that wasn't the main reason. Think about it. After Even after Jesus rose from the dead and stayed on the earth another 40 days, there was nobody doing much of anything. Nobody was bold. So when Jesus lay in the grave that Saturday and his disciples were scared, what was the reason the disciples were scared? I mentioned, yes, they were cowardly. The main reason why is that they did not believe that Jesus would rise from the dead. And the gospel record confirms that. And of course, they knew nothing of the Holy Spirit of God. That was their problem. Now, I want you to imagine with me, think for me for a moment. That has great relevance to us today. Yes, Christ is risen, absolutely, and that's a big difference. Not minimizing that, but I already told you that after Jesus rose from the dead for the next 40 days, nobody was doing much of anything. And we know why. We know why. So what do these scared 
cowardly disciples, what do they tell us? Let's stand now and turn to our Bibles to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Acts chapter 4, verse 13, and I'm going to read through verse 33. Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed, standing there, standing with them, they could say nothing against it, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they considered, conferred among themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they may speak henceforth to no man in his name, in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge you. But we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old, on whom the miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all this, all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them is, in them is that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage? And the people imagined vain things. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles. And the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost that they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that out of the things not sold, neither any of them that out of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And then verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. You may be seated and close your Bibles, please. Now there we have a completely different picture of the disciples. Before Jesus rose from the dead and afterwards, and not only that, but the coming of the Spirit of God. What a resurrection and the Spirit of God makes. What a difference. May we have not a trace of the disciples on that Saturday, but let us emulate and by the grace of God and by his power have the persona and the grace and the power that the disciples had that we just described. That's my text, verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Let's be clear of the context. We're in the book of Acts. The great power to witness of the resurrection, the great grace that they had 
was due to the Spirit of God, not due to them. They didn't all, all of a sudden become an alpha male. It's the Spirit of God that made the difference. Of course, nearly every sermon in the book of Acts, they preach the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Yes, we should preach the death of Christ, which atoned for our sins, but the resurrection of Christ gives us eternal life, provides our justification. It's not a complete gospel until we mention the resurrection of Christ. I have, I believe, two points, my message, short message this afternoon. First, our testimony of Christ's resurrection will through his spirit, will through his spirit be given with great power. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The disciples on Saturday were afraid, deathly afraid. The Lord Jesus had just been shamed, tortured in his passion, nailed to the cross, and now lay dead in the grave. And they were afraid. Not only afraid, they felt hopeless and helpless. They felt the acute pressure from all sources, from the religious rulers, from Rome, from Nero. And friends, men, they experience more pressure than we've ever had or ever will if we remain in the Western world. Let us not entertain ourselves. Yes, we have pressure from the cancel culture. We have pressure from wokeism, from feminism, from LGBTQ community, and from gender equality. Of course, we have pressure from that. But it's nothing compared to the pressure of being under Nero. We're not going to be decapi decapitated soon. We're not going to be fed to the wild animals, nor slain by gladiators. So let's not be too hard on the disciples while they are hidden, shivering in fear on Saturday in the upper room. You see, their problem was not primarily one of a lack of courage, although that was part of it. It was not because they were not learned men, because as the Pharisees said, they were unlearned and ignorant men. They had not experienced the resurrection, had not happened, and they certainly had not experienced the coming of the Holy Spirit that the men we read about experienced after Pentecost. Now, God sending his Holy Spirit at Pentecost is all of grace. Well, as I've said, not of anything of ourselves, not anything about our zeal, our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, our desire to die for ourselves, or anything such thing. God must have the glory, not only in our salvation, but in our sanctification, in our glorification, and anything in between. We must not blame the, laws, the last days, the hard hardness of lost sinners, the culture, or anything else until we look at our own lives and how we, what we say and do and what our lives, does it parallel these disciples of the day of Pentecost? Do they prepare themselves to be filled by the Spirit of God? Because there are requirements God is sovereign. He sends his Holy Spirit whomsoever he wills based upon his judgment we they were fit to be filled by the Spirit of God. I'm not talking that our aim to be filled by the Spirit of God is to produce signs and wonders for the building to shake, to speak in tongues, foreign language or otherwise. I'm not saying that. I'm a convinced cessationalist. And I believe all these apostolic signs ended when the apostles wrote the scriptures so we can read them. And we don't have to see that there's a man who's doing miracles, so he must be sent by Christ. I think in this Western world in particular, I believe in the cessation of these profound signs and wonders spiritual gifts. Now, I will make exception in the third world of visions and dreams and such, but we're not in the third world. And, of course, I'm not talking about prosperity theology. 
either. Let us first begin by making a brutal assessment of ourselves. We are not filled with the Spirit of God. We do not testify of the witness of the resurrection with this kind of convincing power. We don't have that zeal. Let's begin with that honest assessment of ourselves. And then let's go beyond that. Not only do we not have the power, we do not have the lives to match. To really, we don't deserve it, of course. But God wants humble vessels. He will resist the proud and give grace unto the humble. We need to be humbled under the mighty hand of God so that God will lift us up in power. Can we say with a clear conscience with Paul, as he said in 1 Thessalonians 1.5, For our gospel came unto you in not in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for yourself, for your sake. Can we say that? I can't say that. And rather, conversely, I have not the power. I have not the assurance that I give my, my people. And I'm not talking about the decisionistic way for God to use me. No. Paul can boast. He, he can say, I am who I am by the grace of God. He, he understood the grace of God. But he also knew that he wanted to have more of the grace of God, more of his power. And so he offered himself as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which he was convinced was his reasonable service. And anything else was unreasonable. And so, men, we need to think, if we want to have the Spirit of God, we need to yield our lives so that God can shape us and form us and use us to be a vessel of honor that is filled with the Spirit. So when we preach the gospel, when we testify of Christ, when we minister to lost souls or even our brothers and sisters, we need to have the convincing Holy Spirit of God through His power so we can give much assurance to people. Don't want to underscore that much assurance. Assurance of the heart. The way that Jesus gave assurance when he told his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. We need to give that kind of assurance to our people. When you minister Christ to people, they need to be assured. They need to have confidence in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our business. To go about, not Jesus only, to go about healing and doing good. I'm not talking about healing, so-called healing ministry. I'm talking about healing the soul. Uh, applying the balm of Gilead. Applying the, the wine, the oil of the gospel and gospel graces to people. That is our job. You don't have to be a minister. You don't have to be elder or deacon. You are a priest. You intercede for the people. Not in a Catholic way, of course, or an Anglican way or, or Eastern Orthodox way. But you... you Bestow grace, not because you have grace, but you are channel. And we need to be empowered with the new thought that Jesus has said, that we have privilege at the throne of grace. We are to minister. We need to the, do the work of mediation. As my Father has sent me, Jesus said, so send I you. That's not just to preach the gospel and to testify of Christ, but it's also to, to minister the healing balm of the love of Christ and of his grace. So let us ask ourselves, men, what can we do to improve our lives, ourselves? Let me touch on a few that we got from, we can garner from our reading. First, let us ask ourselves if we reserve a time every day, not just a check off devotional time, I read my Bible, but a real time of intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's what the Pharisees concluded. And they observed that they spent time with Jesus. Now, let me ask you, when you testify to the lost world, do you think that they're thinking, this is a man that spent time with Jesus? Because, see, our time with Jesus should bring a, a change of our perspective. I'm not saying we have to be like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai. I'm not saying we have to have our garments gleaming like Jesus in the transformation, in, in the in transfiguration. I'm not saying that. But we should have something about us that is nondescript, that cannot be denied, 
As we are giving them assurance, it's because we spent time with Jesus. That's available to all of us, not just to Peter and John. You see, it's not just Mary, Martha, and Peter and John that need to spend time with Jesus. We all do, and for the same reason. And of course, it's not just spending the time with Jesus. We need to obey his words. As Matthew said, Ma Matthew Kuhn said, the Apostle John was, he was obsessed with Jesus' words of love. Not only the Gospel of John, but in his epistle. Love, love, love. We need to have love. Now, this is the Apostle John, who is nearly 100 years old, reflecting all the Gospel of the Gospels were written. But he by the Spirit of God, said, you know, let me just reinforce Jesus' words. Let me give them a perspective. That's why John's gospel is so different, a heavenly gospel. A gospel upon reflection does not merely reiterate another synoptic view, but a different view, a heavenly view, a godly view. Jesus is God, and we need to think godly and heavenly. And so his last departing words, the apostle John in the Isle of I'm not sure if you wrote the Gospel of John on Patmos or not, but I knew he wrote Revelation there. But that's what he thought. The beloved apostle who, when he was young, with his brother, sons of thunder. Lord, should we send fire down? This is not the same John. He was transformed by conversion and love for Christ. Gentle John. Luke records in Acts 532, and we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey him. That's something we can do. That's something that will engender, perhaps, God to want to send his Spirit to us. It's there for a reason. We obey God because God works in our heart to give us humility to want to obey him. It's not will worship or will service. It's God who gets the glory in everything, in our consecration, in everything. But brothers, we need to obey. As you know, be doers of the word, not hearers only, lest we deceive ourselves. We do not have the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's first check our own hearts, and again, not blame this lost world, arrogant, Wicked sinners or the culture. Let us blame ourselves. Let us look at ourselves. Why we do not have the Holy Spirit. And then ask ourselves, do we have this unbridled desire to spread the word of God? Can we truly say and feel we cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard? We have seen and heard things, haven't we? You've been saved. You see answer to prayer. You, you hear brothers and sisters here, answer to prayer. You've seen things that God has done through Jesus. And see, if we're in good shape and good spiritual form, we couldn't contain ourselves. You see, Jesus says that out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. The waters have to go somewhere. It has to flow. And so when you're filled with the Spirit of God, it, you have to speak. And so the disciples said, we cannot but speak. We can't help ourselves. Beat us all you will, but we have to speak. We have to obey God rather than men, not because we are strong, but because we're compelled to do so by the Spirit of God. So brothers, can we say that we have this unbridled, unrestrained, we can't help ourselves, but we need to talk about Jesus and brag on him. Third, do we pray like the disciples prayed in the book of Acts? We know that Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem in the upper room until you be endued with the Spirit from on high. We, we know that. They prayed before that. But it also says they prayed in this passage. They prayed for boldness. They didn't just say one prayer. The Spirit came, doing miraculous things through them. But they were not presumptuous. They continued to pray. They wanted more boldness. They were bold as bold can be, but they did not limit God. They knew God could do more than this. God, don't, don't limit yourself through me. Do more. That's so why they prayed for more boldness. And God sent the Holy Spirit to give them boldness. And they were so bold. 
They were bold in the resurrection of Christ. We need to think what that means. I know we're all going to celebrate that tomorrow. But we need to think about it every day. What? Reversing all the law of physics, all the law of nature, all the law of decomposition, all the, the, the laws of second, the second law of thermodynamics, to put together that which the law says must disperse, must come to disorder. Do, that God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, raised them from the dead, and that is our future? And how can we restrain ourselves with joy? Let us not make the Christian, our Christian life a factoid, a group of factoids that doesn't move us. We have a living faith. We have a living God. We have a living gospel. The question is, are we alive? Let us not, be, let us not stop up this channel of grace that God wants to use for us. That's why we're here. We're created in Christ Jesus unto good works so we can serve him. That's what our business is, to serve Christ, to be used by him. Fourth and last, they had church unity. One is of heart, one is of soul in preaching and testifying of Christ's resurrection from the dead. Now, I was a little bit debating in my mind, but I'm going to give you an example. From my own life, when I was a baby Christian, when I had some zeal. More zeal than I have now. I was a first-year medical student at UCLA. And God used me to speak to my classmate, Judy Menhivar, now known as Judy Kagan. And we would use our lunch time at UCLA. The medical school is in the southernmost part of the campus, around the bomb shelter, where all the, the science majors dwelt. The northern campus was those those weak liberal arts people. <laughs> and so I wanted the strong stuff. So during lunchtime, Judy and I would evangelize. And we had no time. It was lunchtime. So we had our, our white professional smocks on, or, or robes, if you want to call it that. And we would talk to students. And they would, you know, as a medical student, we had these short ones. It was only when you become an attending physician that you get to be a Pharisee in the long ones. <laughs> but I had a short smock, but people knew I was a medical student, as well as my, my friend Judy. And God gave us some level of the desire to spread the gospel. And we did. We used that lunchtime, almost every lunchtime, to spread the gospel. That was our joy. That was our pleasure. Of course, you'd spend every day preparing for the day by spending time with Jesus and reading the Bible, confessing our sins, praying that God would use us that day. We prayed before and after evangelism. We had church unity on this issue of evangelism. And things were going well. Until one day, both of us got a summons, a summons to, a, to appear before the honor council composed of upperclassmen fourth-year medical students, chaired by a Mormon. This was an honor council, and we were to report why we're being dishonorable by mentioning the name of Jesus. They said, if you don't stop, you're out of here. You're not out of medical school. But we didn't stop. We took off our white gowns, and they went to the weak part of campus, the northern campus to talk to the students there. <laughs> because I had talked to a young Chinese Buddhist girl, and my friend and sister Judy, she was much more bold than I, and she had talked to a Jewish girl who was hospitalized in the hospital. They had brought the girl to our classroom, and she had a terminal disorder, terminal condition, and Judy's heart broke and said, I need to talk to her about Jesus. So we, so we went to the Center for the Health Sciences. That's before Geffen gave, Geffen gave a bunch of money. It wasn't called that when we went to medical school. And she shared with that young Jewish girl, Jesus. But both of their parents found out, the Buddhist girl, the Jewish girl, and all hell broke loose at UCLA. Every student hated us. Every student looked down on us. But we had joy in the Lord. Now, I say that now because I don't 
have nearly the zeal that I did, in my opinion, when I was a first or second year medical, first, first year medical student. And that was long ago, that was in 1980, some 43 years ago. But I wanted just to share with you that God can use you and threats that people give you, they, they, they're like vapor because you have to do the will of God. Nothing matters but bragging on Jesus, testifying of what he has done. You see, God, I don't say wants to use us because that sounds a little bit too, too effeminate, but in his will, if we want to do his will, we would want to be used by him. So brothers, I want to encourage you, let have no remnant, no sliver of yourself like the disciples on Saturday. Yes, I know the resurrection had not occurred yet, but practically speaking, that was not the main reason for their boldness. I've already told you that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus probably were converted, and they were shy as heck. And the 40, and the, the, the disciples, the Christians, 40 days while Jesus was still on earth, were, were not bold at all either. So the difference is not the resurrection in and of itself, but that which is connected to the resurrection in our life. And so let's not have any remnant in our life of this cowardly fear of the world, fear of the devil, fear of anything else. If anything, fear yourself. Fear your Adamic nature and crucify your flesh with the affections and lusts because the enemy is within the gates. It's easy to say the devil did it and you know, all these kind of things, the demonic and stuff like that. And it's real, of course it's real. That's our battle against principalities and powers. But let's not forget that we have to first conquer ourselves first before we are any good in the battle. In fact, we are missing it in action if we do not conquer by the grace of God through the power of the Spirit ourselves. Judy and I shared with the people the words of Christ. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. We believe that, we experience that, and we believe that other people, if they believe that, would be transformed, would be converted. If they truly trusted Christ as a guilty, broken, helpless sinner and came to Jesus for forgiveness of sins. Those were my treasured memories that I want to relive again. Now, Paul prayed, I'm almost done. Paul prayed that every Christian would have this power from the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know his motto, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul, didn't you know Jesus already? Yes, he knew him. Jesus in his high priestly prayer, prayer defined what it is to know Jesus and what eternal life is. This is eternal life, to know him, the one living God, and him whom thou hast sent. That is eternal life, and that is knowing God and knowing Christ. It's a relationship. That was Paul's motto, to know him better, to know Jesus more intimately. And by knowing him more intimately, we have more power from his spirit. We tap into the power of his resurrection. Here's Paul's prayer in Ephesians. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, to all Christians, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Jesus when he raised him from the dead? And not only that, but set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. That power, my brothers, is available to us. That which rose Christ from the dead. And not that only to the earth, but to the highest heaven, to God's right hand, so that he reigns supreme over everything. That is Paul's prayer. Is that what you want from God? I told a lie a moment ago. That I'm not almost done. That was just my first point. But my second point is short. Second, 
our testimony of Christ's resurrection will, through his spirit, bring great, God's great grace upon us. And with great power, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. I'm a little bit too lazy to clean up, too, so I'm trying to make it a little bit longer. The, this grace which God sent to the disciples is not favored with the people, which is what the grace that the early church had with the people. When it said that the Lord added to the church daily should be saved, it was because they found favor with the people. That was a big part of why they were able to win people to Christ. And I am not minimizing, relegating that grace. It's so important. If you're ministering to somebody, I'm not talking about the world in general. The world hates us. But if you're dealing with an individual, you want them to find favor with you. They need to see that you are a man full of grace, yes, and of truth like Jesus. You want them to like you, even if they don't like you for your position, but you want them to want to like you despite your position because their conscience has to say, this person wants to do me good. So I'm not minimizing that charis, that favor of God, but this favor spoken here is the favor from God, the grace from God, and that makes all the difference. It's the grace of God that along with his love is the impetus, the motivation of all of what God does. I talked about God's power. We're talking about God's grace. And they're intertwined, except for the case of God's judgment and condemnation. God's power is always manifested by his God, God's grace. And even in God's judgment and condemnation is grace when it's shown in the gospel. Because he judged Christ to give us grace. That's what the gospel is. So this grace that God gives us, where does it come from? Where does God's grace come from? Like all things, it comes from the Father of lights, of course, but through our mediator. He mediates everything. Our mediation with God through salvation, through prayers, as well as what God sends to us. It's given to us through the grace of Christ. And so the beloved apostle John said in John 1.6, think of the words, and of his Christ's fullness have all we received and grace for grace. You see, we receive Jesus' fullness. He offers it to us. He wants us to be like him. The question is, do we want to be like him? You see, we, we make the ceiling, not Jesus. He wants to give us all his fullness, all of his grace. He mediates God's grace through him. The question is, how hungry are we? How hungry are we and thirsty are we for righteousness? Because we will be filled through God, through his mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. All that we are and all that we hope to be is not really because of our mother, as Abraham Lincoln said, but because of Christ. Through Christ, we have God's grace. And that's why we need just one of the additional reasons why we need more of Christ, because we need more of God's power. We need more of God's grace. And my God sent to us more of his power and grace for his great glory. Amen.